All right, I'm muting everyone. We're rolling. Benny, do I got you? You got me. All right, we're ready to roll. So, yep, we're going to go right. um, real quick. Big thanks to my cousin, Ben. Ben, um, kind of explain in like the shortest time possible what you do for Red Bull. Uh, for Red Bull, I produce a feature length documentary films. Those are usually about 90 minutes long and release a couple of them a year. So uh, at any given time, we're working on, I would say like on average four to six different movies. Some are just starting, you know, some were out shooting in the field and others were editing or getting ready to put up on Netflix, HBO, you name it. So that's and, what and, I do for what's, Red Bull. What's, what's your role kind of when these films or when these ideas come out, what's your role? Are you, you're kind of putting a team together, right? Yeah, so I run the department for feature films as a VP, and then I'm also a producer on the movies themselves, which is really like a project manager. So I'm working with the director, who's our creative lead. I'm working with the editors, the writers, um, working with the camera guys, and like really trying to build out the right team to see it through. And then also looking after things like money and schedule and bringing it to the line in high quality, but also within the time and and money that we've been allotted to do it, um, either yeah. by my company or for a client. No, oh, really, really good and really appreciate it. Benny lives in Malibu, California, so um, it's a little bit earlier. We're interrupting dinner time, but I really appreciate this because, you know, one of the one of the main goals today is to just get out of our comfort zone a little bit. And what a better way to do that, even if you just watch the trailer. Um, if you went ahead and watched the movie, that's great, but you can get the gist of it by watching the trailer of the Don Wall. Um, and by the way, like we didn't even have to talk about this movie with Ben on here because, um, you know, he, he completed probably one of the most mentally grueling tasks any human can do. Um, he, I don't know when it was a couple of years ago, he, he completed an Ironman and what an Ironman is, um, you swim 2.4 miles. Then you bike 112, and then you run a marathon, just a nice little finisher of a 26-mile run. Um, most of us can't even run twice or three times around the block without giving up, let alone doing all three of those things in, in pretty much a day. So, I mean, you want to talk about a background here. You have a dude that not only, you know, it works with these extreme mentally uh, fit athletes, um, out of the box, not a baseball or basketball or football player, but, you know, you have a dude on here that has completed this daunting task of an Ironman that I can't even really wrap my head around. So, Benny, talk about that for a couple minutes, and then we'll get going on the Don Wall. Yeah, Ironman was uh, more than a couple years ago. It was about a decade ago. But, oh, my uh, bad. I just know you did it. Uh, no, I was actually just looking for a challenge and I started with a shorter triathlon and I didn't really know, I'd never done a marathon, I'd never done, you know, any of those kind of distances at all. So they were equally daunting to me when I first kind of even saw Ironman, I, that wasn't even in my, my thought process, but I went for a shorter one, an Olympic distance one, which is still a long way. You swim about a mile, you run about six and you bike about 25 so you know it's an effort but putting your mind to it most people can can figure that out and kind of gut it out but had a lot of fun doing it kept doing it did some longer distances over the period of a couple of years and then i really committed myself for the period of a year to just you know i wasn't going out partying i wasn't staying out late i put everything in towards this because you have to do a lot of training you have to really eat a certain way and you have to get your, your mind and your body ready to handle those distances. It's not something you can just show up and like gut out with sheer willpower. You really have to have, you know, both the mental, mental ability to do it, but also just like get your body ready for it. So you don't melt down during the race. You see a lot of people fall apart out there. So uh, it was a long day, um, but it was really like the effort of training for a year. And every day you just go a little bit further, you do a little bit more. And pretty, you know, what was pretty hard at the beginning of the training, running whatever, five miles or seven miles, all of a sudden that's kind of your warm up. And then you kick into another year. And when you hit that level, it's just sort of happens over a long period of time. You got to have a long term outlook to, to take something like that 
on. And I think that's pretty applicable to what you see in the Don Wall or even the level of sports that you guys are playing at, where you're going in day in and day out, putting in the work. Some days you firing on all cylinders. Other days it's hard to get out of bed, but you, you, you do it, you commit to it, and, and the results come. Yeah, no doubt. And, uh, you know, it, again, kind of kind of moving forward and, and taking us out of our comfort zone and talking to Benny today about the Don Wall, the movie that obviously he oversaw. Um, and, and real quick, you have, you have this Tommy Caldwell as the main character in the movie. You know, you want to put him on a, on a pedestal. You, you know, he's a, he's a Mike Trout. He's a LeBron James. He's a Michael Jordan. He's a generational type of climber. And that, that's kind of the pedestal that, you know, this guy is, is on from an equation to, you know, a, a sport type of out, outlook or as an athlete. And then you take the mountain, this uh, Al Capitan, where, you know, it kind of goes into bullet point number one, where impossible is a mindset. Well, basically what, what, was, what was talked about um, is that this particular point in the wall and I'll let Benny explain this a little bit more, but it could never be, it could never be climbed. It couldn't be done. It's, it, it was an impossible feat. You had all these master, you know, you had all these elite climbers saying, you know, you're even silly to try it. And it just seemed like from this guy's upbringing, um, we'll talk about his obstacles that he went through. Um, but it just seemed like that never was in his mindset that when you say the word impossible, he saw that as a challenge. And, and that's got to be where our head's at. When, when you don't think you can do something, you got to meet that task and you got to meet that challenge head on. Um, ben, you could elaborate that on a little bit more because I know you've worked with them and personally and just, just talk about that little um, impossible as a mindset kind of bullet point and what you've taken away from working through this film and other films before that. Yeah, I mean, obviously Tommy has a lot of uh, skill and talent and he had, you know, he had a knack for it when he was young. His father saw it and really kind of fostered that in him. But it wasn't that he was head and shoulders above everybody else, you know, at a young age. It's just he really had a passion for it and stuck with it. This particular climb, though, it was sort of a coveted part of the wall on El Capitan, which is the hardest climb in Yosemite. And for generations, you know, the best rock climbers in the world go there, live there, train there, and climb. And... You know, before that, Tommy had put up more new routes on El Capitan that had never been done than anyone else. But they were all sort of in between the existing areas that people were climbing. There's a whole other side of the wall that everybody said it was too steep. It was too sheer. The holds were too small. I mean, there's places where you can just barely hold on by the tips of your fingers. And this isn't for 50 feet. This is for hundreds of feet. Um, and so, you know. A lot of people didn't think it could ever be done because for many generations, no one had, had ever come close to doing it. And he took on this challenge and it, you know, he put every ounce of his energy into it. And it took him seven years. And this is in the prime of this guy's career. He's a major athlete, got big sponsors. And a lot of people in climbing and the sponsors too are like, you know, wondering if he was throwing away the best part of his career to do, try to do this thing that, you know, no one had ever done. And honestly, for many years, it didn't even look like he was close to doing, but he kept going back and he really kind of stuck with that task. Yeah. And, and I really, you know, watching the documentary, um, kind of going through his upbringing and it goes right into the point number two, where, you know, obstacles are only illusions. And, you know, a lot of us see these road bumps that we hit on a daily basis we're in a road bump right now with this virus and, you know, stay at home, seniors can't play, lost our seat. You know, this is, this is a road bump and it's gotta be an illusion in our head. It's gotta be a mental state that we're going to, you know, like we talked about last week, we have to use this frustration for fuel and we have to use kind of our, um, the, the lack of what we're doing right now into some type of work and some type of do and some type of motivation to just get moving. And, you know, the, one of the one of my bigger takeaways from this documentary was the obstacles that he overcame. Um, he was invited when he was 18 years old, which some of you on this call are 18 years old, to this big climb in Kyrgyzstan. And um, what happened is he was with a group of really really elite climbers. Um, 
and he was held hostage. Some terrorists held him hostage. And, you know, we're, we're all older and you guys have watched movies and, you know, seen our movies and stuff. And he had to make a decision because these hostages obviously didn't have a plan where they were taking them. They just kind of took them hostage. And he had to throw one of them off the cliff in order to survive and, and to, to um, you know, to survive for his team and, and make sure that he was surviving and he was going to be safe. That's, you know, put yourself in, in those shoes for a second. And that's number one, that's very, very traumatic. But at the end of the day, that, that's a reality. And a lot of us could, you know, that would break a lot of us. That would mentally um, damage a lot of us. And it seemed like it really just gave him the opportunity to take on, you know, anything else wouldn't be as big as that, that challenge that he had to overcome. Um, that was the first one. Then as the document gets going, you know, Tommy cuts his finger off. And whatever accident he was doing, I don't know if he was cooking or he was doing something, he ended up, um, he ended up amputating his index finger and they couldn't, they couldn't save it. So for a climber, think about this, that, you know, you're depending upon 10 fingers and 10 toes. That's essentially your resource and your lifeline. Now all of a sudden he doesn't have an index finger. And what, you know, and Ben, Benny will elaborate this a little bit more, but he almost became a better climber after he lost his index finger. I don't even know how that's possible, but again, try playing baseball without a hand, try playing baseball without a foot. That's kind of where we're at right now with this, with this, with this athlete. Um, Benny, go ahead and talk about that in your, in kind of your eyes and, and how that related to, to him. Yeah, well, he cut up his finger in a, a woodworking accident. He was working on a house and he cut off his finger. And, you know, the doctor was like, you're probably going to be hanging this up. And everybody, you know, there's just certain moves at the level that he's climbing that, you know, is critical to be able to do different holds. And, you know, within a year, he had come back and he had done a lot of strength training. He had done a lot to kind of toughen it up and um, kind of beat up the nerve endings on the end of it so he could reach training, learn new ways to hold his fingers. And basically within a year, he was completing climbs that even when he had all of his fingers just one year earlier, he had never been able to do. And, you know, even if he was stronger and even if he, you know, had toughened that up and found new ways to do it, it certainly wasn't easier. So, I mean, that's clearly a mental breakthrough where he's just put it but started to find new problems, find new ways to move his body and, and to kind of work around that to a level where he was actually came back stronger, which is really hard to wrap your mind around. Yeah. And like, that was just a huge takeaway for me because it's just, you know, if we get injured, um, you know, or pitchers, Tommy John surgery or rotator cuff or whatever the, whatever the roadblock is, the obstacle is, it just seems like that you, there's always some doubt in the back of your mind. There's always some, you know, well, will I ever be as good as I was? And it's it just proven that like when you set your mind to it and you just have this elite um, framework for your mind to work, it's, it's, you know, there's really no, there's really no limits to, to where, where we're going. And he's just living proof of, of that, which I thought was really, you know, really, really valuable. Um, the, the, the point number three, my, 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 my last huge takeaway from this documentary was so to paint a picture, Tommy um, gets to this pitch. I believe it's pitch 15. I don't know if it was the hardest pitch, but it was, it was like really, really hard and took him a long while to complete the pitch. Well, he's climbing with a partner and this, this uh, Kevin guy in, he had, Benny, real quick, talk about the difference between the two climbers and how they kind of paired up to, to be a team. Yeah. Well, Tommy, Tommy was the one who really decided to take this on. And he was really sort of the most accomplished climber ever on El Capitan in Yosemite, the style of climbing. I mean, he was at the top of the grade already. And he put his mind to do it for those reasons and others that you'll see if you, if you checked it out or if you do check it out. But he, he took on this task. And you know, he's alone. Different climbers were coming in and out. Alex Honnold went there and climbed with him for a season. His dad was going up there. You know, a bunch of the top guys were going there to visit him, to help him kind of work it out. But he didn't really have a partner at the time, and he really needed one. And uh, there was another climber who was from a whole different discipline, 
didn't know Tommy, but was really inspired by what he was doing. And he was living in California. He did a whole different style of climbing, which is largely done in gyms or really low rock features. It's called bouldering. And while you do it much closer to the ground, where Tommy's climbing two, 3,000 feet up sheer cliffs, living on the side of the wall, he kind of had that pedigree. You know, Kevin was, was climbing, you know, 20, 30 feet off the ground, but they do these really dynamic moves where they, you know, pull down on, on grips and they, they jump up, you know, four, five, six, seven feet, grab the next hold in midair and just these super athletic power moves. And, um, you know, it was sort of the combination of the two of these guys coming from different backgrounds that made them a really dynamic team because Tommy had to show Kevin everything about how to survive and climb in this big mountain environment. But Kevin had a bunch of skills that Tommy didn't that actually, you know, he was able to teach Tommy that helped him crack certain parts of this code because, you know, you're going up 3,000 feet. So it takes a lot of different tools and moves to be able to accomplish that. And, and you know, it was the combination of the two of them, that, you know, kind of putting their skills together. That was a difference maker. Yeah, and so they get to this per spe specific spot in the in the climb, and how they're kind of teaming. Like one guy would do it, and the other guy would do it, and they wouldn't move on until both of them got through the climb. Well, they got to the really this pitch fifteen, which is really the hardest the hardest pitch, and um, Tommy did it, and he was waiting. I don't I don't remember exactly how long he was waiting for, but. You know, it, it was it was getting to the point where when you're watching the documentary, you're like, all right, if this is me, I'm moving on because he's going to hold you back. And Tommy definitely could, you know, he's close, close to the mountain. It looks like he's going to get um, done. And what, what transpired was he didn't want to accomplish the climb without his partner. And he said, no, I'm going to wait. And, you know, I don't know how long he waited for, but, you know, not only was there a tremendous upon pressure on his teammate, but I think it really, like, it would have been really, really defeating if the, the partner had to give up, if Kevin had to give up. And um, what, what Tommy did is like, look, I'm not, I'm not just in this for myself. We're doing this together and we're either going to, we're either going to be on top of the mountain together or we're, you know, or we're not going to accomplish this. And like just true selflessness, um, you know, not everyone has that, inaptability to be a great teammate and to you know really take themselves away from the limelight because he could have been on top of that mountain way before his partner and that was a choice he made because he wanted to do it together and and he wanted to push his teammate and he wanted and he did and then you know Kevin actually made the pitch and you know it was just really moving because the way the documentary was going in my mind it was like well this guy's done time is going to get to the top of the mountain and that's it and it was the complete opposite so I mean, Betty, you want to talk about that a little bit? Because I think that really hits home with, with our guys and, um, you know, just, just being, just wanting, you know, the guy next to you just to do as good as, as you and, and kind of, you know, it frees you up a little bit. Yeah, I mean, with any great team or any high-performing team, you know, different people have different strengths, different people have different weaknesses, you know, and it's usually the strongest teams are the ones that can cover on Businesses, other their their own strength, kind of coach and help each other, and and a lot of it's a mental thing too. If you see somebody that's driving hard and pushing themselves harder, you want to rise to that level. And then you know if somebody's chomping at your heels, you want to go a little bit further. And it's it's sort of that friendly competition amongst teammates where you're really pushing each other and holding each other accountable. And that's really going to rise raise the bar. And that's true whether you're you're playing baseball or you're trying, you know, to climb something impossible or you're trying to make a film, you know, you're working with a lot of different personalities and you really want to cater to each other's strengths and, and lift each other up. And, and usually that's where the best result comes from. And it's also a much sweeter way to win when you do it together. And, you know, yeah, Tommy could have accomplished it, gone down in the history books alone. And, and I'm sure Kevin would have thrown in the towel without Tommy's support. Um, you know, but he did it. He did it together. And that was also honoring the years and years that Kevin put his own life on hold to support Tommy in this dream. I mean, he had invested years of time. So, yeah, Tommy could have left him behind. But, you know, he wanted to also honor him because if Kevin hadn't kept showing up year after year, who knows if Tommy would have stuck with it because, you know, he needed that camaraderie. Yeah, it's just, I mean, 
there's just really good value there. There's really good lessons there. And that's, that's what we got to strive to be. That's as a teammate. And as you know, a person, you got to want to make that guy next to you better. And you got to, you got to want to show up every day and understand that, you know, I'm going to war, you're going to war, we're going to war together and we're, we're winning and losing together. That's, that's how, that's how it works. That's how this thing works. Um, my last point on my big board and uh, I want you guys to think of some questions how we're going to do it too. If you want to ask a question, just go to the Zoom group chat um, and throw throw a question in there. If you got a question for Benny, um, I'll kind of like ask it and then he'll answer it. So if you guys got a question, just start throwing them in there. Um, I got like one more point that we're going to hit on. And then, you know, if you guys want to ask anything, go ahead. If not, we'll just, we'll just get out. But um, just, if you guys got anything to throw it in that Zoom group chat and, and we'll hit it, we'll hit it in about, five minutes. But the last thing I want to talk about is just something that, you know, after watching the documentary, obviously talking to Ben a bunch, um, I came up with this extreme measures require extreme mindset. And, you know, when, when we're out of the box, not baseball oriented, but you're, you're watching documentaries like this and Benny, you're going to elaborate this on a lot more because you've worked with these extreme athletes with crazy, crazy mindsets with that. There's no limits to what they can accomplish on a much, much higher level than, you know, let's say baseball, basketball, or football, um, you know, you're almost, you're almost incorporating life and death in these situations. Um, and just talk about like where these athletes' minds, minds are and the, the lessons that maybe you've learned from them, anything that you can give to these high school kids as they, you know, finish up high school, get on to college. Some of them will have great college careers, great high school careers. Some of them might, you know, get an opportunity to play pro ball and, you know, anything that you could add just to an elite mindset standpoint would be really, really valuable right now. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of really talented people about the sporters, the rock climbers, the motocross guys, or any of the, you know, uh, elite professional athletes in any team sport. I mean, there's a certain caliber you have to be to be professional and to be there or to be competing at that high of a level. But then within that, you know, you see a separation from, from those who are really extraordinary, that are really like pushing the boundaries. A lot of it is those kind of earlier points that have already been hit in terms of, you know, setting your own boundaries for what's possible, setting your own um, kind of work ethic, overcoming those obstacles, putting in the work kind of day after day. And like you see that work ethic from any of those truly elite athletes. I was talking to Tommy about it a little bit too, even watching this Jordan doc and you just see he's the best player on the team, but that doesn't stop them from coming in early, going late, practicing hard, going hard, going to put in that extra effort. And that, that's a big part of it. Yeah. I mean, part of this uh, is it all, you know, it's, it's, it's overcoming those, those mental barriers that we set for ourselves. It's, it's having a long-term vision, not looking for that quick payoff, that instant gratification. So you have that vision, you put in the work, and you stick with it, and uh, and you know the results generally come. So that's that's what I see out of a lot of these guys. And uh, you know we we talk about being in the zone in team sports or in sports in general. And sometimes in these sports they call it the flow state, but it's it's almost where you've done it so much, you turn the brain off and you just start to do, and you can hit this level. And, um, you know, that comes with mastery and, and that's just time and, and commitment and, and dedication to your craft. And it needs to come from a place where it's self-driven, you know, where you're getting yourself just a great coach or your parents who are, who are driving that result. You have to love it too. Otherwise you can't sustain that level of work if you don't truly love it. So, you know, you got to find that passion and combine it with your skills and, and the results will come. Yeah. And like the last thing I wrote on the board is just commit to the do, put your feet down on the ground and, and, and start working, start, you know, wh whatever the roll the boat mentality, the, the, the commit to the do mentality, the, you know, find the zone, get your tunnel vision. We talk about a bunch of this stuff and um, you know, it's just really, I, like I said, I wanted to get our, I wanted to get our guys out of the comfort zone a little bit and talk to you. And I think there's some, some serious, just um, good lessons to be learned outside of the box and outside of what we're doing. So, um, you know, um, we're going to, I'm going to, someone's going to ask a question on here and we're not going to get off this thing until I got a leader on this thing that, that posts a question on here. So I don't care who does it. 
um, somebody's going to ask a question. So if I got to, if I got to drag my own son out of, out of the other room to ask a question, actually, let's just put him on the spot right now. Christian, you're going to start this. Uh, so um, go ahead, son, ask a question to your cousin. What do you got? <coughs> um, hmm. uh, the most crazy spot you've ever been to while filming? Uh, a few years ago, we got to go up to the North Pole to film mountain biking in the summer. And in the summer at the North Pole, it never gets dark. And uh, the sun just kind of goes around in a circle like this. So we were out there camping out. We had to have electric fence around the camp. There's no towns or villages on this island. And there's wolves, there's polar bear. Uh, so it's a pretty wild spot. It was pretty, pretty rowdy to be up there at the top of the world. And flying in these little aircrafts and landing in these, you know, dirt glacier fields and stuff like that. Pretty cool. Great. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Um, anyone else got anything? Uh, Double T, you got anything for the cause here? Let's, let's get a question out of Double T here. There you go. Man, I didn't know you were going to come at me like that. Um, Hold on, we got Crowder. Hold on, Crowder's got a question. Anything you would change if you did it again? Anything you would change if you did it again? Oh, uh, no, no, no regrets so far. So far, <laughs> so good. Living that Malibu life, yeah. I wouldn't. I don't think I'd change anything either. You know, um, we got another question. How long did it take you to finish uh, your Iron Man? Uh, it took me over fourteen hours. A little over 14 hours to, to finish. Um, and then the training from the first day I started triathlon training till the end of my Ironman was just shy of three years. Is kind of how to, to, to build up to that, that length. Nice, 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 nice. T, you got, T, you got anything? Did you think of a question yet? No, you got nothing. Just you, you, uh, he wasn't even listening. I know we got another one. What was your mental preparation? Like Benny, what, what was your mental preparation for the challenge? So before your Ironman, how did you, how were you mentally? What was your state like? Yeah. I mean, you get, you get the confidence from, you know, doing things before and being successful. So, you know, going out and just doing a couple of marathons is important. There's certain, days where you do longer distances than your ultimate Ironman day. So you have to go out and do 130 miles on the bike and then you come off the bike and you do a, uh, you know, a half uh, marathon after that on just like a random Sunday. And so it's sort of knowing that you can do it. It's knowing what food you need, what, you know, where your body is. And so, you know, a lot of that feels physical, but when it comes down to it, it's just like, okay, I've been this far before, I know I can do it. And it's, it's that confidence, that mental state that you've adequately prepared and, and that you're ready to go. And you just have to carry that through. And, you know, way after the Ironman was over, I'd be in situations where I'd get up and talk in front of my company or a bunch of pro athletes. And, and you get nervous like anyone else, but then you kind of pull from that, like, oh man, I've been through some hard stuff came out on the other side, it all worked out fine. So you can take that confidence and kind of parlay it into the next, the next big thing. Yeah, we got a couple other questions here that are coming in. Mac has a good one. Uh, Andrew Mac here, uh, hang on. Now they're just cut. When you were in the Ironman, did you ever lose confidence in finishing the race? And if so, what did you do to stay on track? Yeah, I was actually thinking I was gonna finish it under 12 hours and I'd set a time goal, which wasn't like that critical for me, but I wanted to have a goal I was targeting based on how I was practicing, what my times were. And um, a couple months before the race, I had been nursing a bit of an injury and I came off that injury. I was feeling pretty good going into race day and about halfway through the bike, so about 60 miles into the bike, I could feel the hamstring was pulling at me again and it was starting to flare up. And I, I knew I had a lot of biking to do and still had the marathon to go. So I just made the decision to pull way back on my pace, um, take it slow, let a bunch of people pass me, which never feels good, um, and save a little bit in the tank because the first priority for me that day was just finishing. And I was able to pull it out and finish because I was 
pull back from that initial goal that I set. And uh, it was a good decision because it mean, meant I didn't have to go back and do another one just to get a finish under my belt. Yeah, that's good. So, uh, Jaden Comia, when's the next Red Bull movie coming out? And is there any other movies on Netflix? Yeah, the next uh, Red Bull movie coming out will be this fall. I'm not exactly sure where it will be, but it might be on Netflix or HBO. Um, it's called The Alpinist, and it's a really, really amazing film. Also in the climbing world, but very different. Um, probably a little more in the vein of Free Solo, but even very different from that. So be on the lookout for that this fall. It's called The Alpinist. Um, all of the other films we've had on, on uh, Netflix have have windowed out, so they license them for a period of time. They're not on Netflix. You can find a bunch of them on Red Bull TV. You can also find a film that's up for a sports Emmy this year on HBO. It's called uh, Any One of Us. So that's a great film, too, for anybody who has HBO. And uh, very, very different type of champion story, but uh, again, overcoming incredible odds and like real spirit of a champion. So uh, if you're looking for something good to watch, that's a great one, too. All right, we got, we got two more questions. Who was the craziest athlete you've ever worked with? Ooh, craziest athlete. Um, probably, it's hard because there's a lot of really wild ones that are tough to compare. Probably Travis Rice. He's a professional snowboarder. Um, his big films are called The Art of Flight, The Fourth Phase. You can check those out too. But um, he's a guy who just has another gear. And even the best people in the world, when they go into the big mountain environment with him, they're like, you know, he is on this entire other plane. So, um, and Benny, you're a pretty, Benny, you're a pretty big snowboarder. So you've done the uh, helicopter drops before, right? I have, yes. Yes, I've been able to get, get up there into Alaska, British Columbia, Japan, a couple other places. And sometimes with these guys and you're carrying... 60 pound backpacks with tripods and cameras trying to you're not riding the exact same line as these guys dropping 100 foot cliffs but uh it still gets pretty crazy out there for sure yeah. so yeah, uh, and, yeah and, go ahead Travis has that mindset though where he's just he sees things that people don't see and he's so incredibly strong and and, and just like a beast of an athlete it's good it was good. All right, last question. It's probably the best question. How long did it take you to grow the stash? Oh, yeah. It was like work in progress since probably like mid-Jan. <laughs> and when the lockdown hit, I just, I fully committed to it. I got rid of the beard and we've been going for it. This guy had kind of a pro and we went for the hawk the other day too. So we're just embracing it, you know? Yeah. You just gotta, you just gotta ride the waves, right? You just gotta ride the waves. Side note too, uh, before we get off this, that I do have a, I have a bucket list. There's, there's uh, June and Beck, but so I got a bucket list item that Benny and I have talked about at some uh, family reunions where I'm gonna get in that. We're gonna get ben, one thing Benny's never done that uh, we're gonna get in the cage with some great whites. So we're gonna, we're gonna jump in the cage and. Uh, and Benny seems to think that's a really good idea, and he's got some really good connections to get us to some really cool parts of the world that these sharks might be really big. So um, I've, I've totally committed, I'm pot committed to this, and um, it's going to be way out of my comfort zone, but I, I, in, ben, in Ben, I trust. So Yeah, every time we're talking a little trash on the text messages, it's always hashtag get in the cage. It's going down. It is going down. So, all right, Benny. Hey, thanks a bunch. You've been, uh, you've been really good getting us out of our comfort zone. We got over 40 guys on this call. So hopefully we, we got something from it. And uh, thanks again. And like I said, check out his movies. I'll be tweeting them out and stuff so you guys can stay in, in, in contact. But awesome. Yeah. So we'll, Thanks we'll for having me. Thanks for the time, guys. And uh, hang in there through this. Come out on the other side while everybody's sleeping and getting lazy and getting, putting on the 10 pounds. Just come out swinging while right. they're sleeping. It's awesome. All right. See you guys. Thanks, Benny. You All right. Have a good night. Yep.